für mich ist das eines der Erfahrungen, die kaum auszuhalten sind in der Ukraine und mit Russlands Krieg, dass er gerechtfertigt wird als Kampf gegen den Faschismus. Das ist eine solche Pervertierung und Umkehrung des Sinns aller politischen Begriffe, dass ein barbarischer Angriffskrieg, der auf die Vernichtung der Ukraine als Nationsziel, der mit systematischer Lügen, Hasspropaganda und entfesselter Gewalt geführt wird, sich maskiert als Antifaschismus. Ja, und tatsächlich ist eine lange Tradition, die schon in der Sowjetunion begonnen hat. Faschisten sind alle, die sich gegen den russischen Imperialismus stellen. Und diesen Begriff dürfen wir Putin und seinen Spin-Doktors nicht überlassen. Ich habe jetzt äh, die Ehre, als nächsten Redner Professor Dr. Klaus Gress anzukündigen. Alle, die sich äh, mit Völkerrecht beschäftigen, ist er ein Begriff. Er ist Professor für Strafrecht und internationales Recht an der Universität Köln und Direktor des Instituts für internationales Friedens- und äh, Sicherheitsrecht war über zehn Jahre hinweg Mitglied der deutschen Delegation bei den Verhandlungen über die Errichtung des ICC und ist heute Sonderberater des Generalstaatsanwalts des ICC zu Fragen des Angriffskriegs Crime of Aggression. Er wird uns einen Überblick geben über den Stand der internationalen Initiativen, um Russland und die russische Führung verantwortlich zu machen für die Verletzungen des Völkerrechts in dem Krieg gegen die Ukraine. Herr Kress, bitte sehr, wir freuen uns auf Ihren Vortrag. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me at the outset to thank the organizers for having convened such an important conference at such a crucial moment in time. And we have just got all more than a flavor of the importance and of the fact that it is a crucial moment by three powerful, welcoming messages. And of course, one so moving that it went right to the bottom of one's heart. This word of gratitude, of course, includes in particular Marie-Louise Beck and Ralph Fuchs together with their splendid team. I wish to premise my remarks by saying that I shall make them solely in my capacity as a scholar and not as a special advisor to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Russia's aggression against Ukraine began in 2014 in Crimea. Since February this year, Russia's course of action against Ukraine has taken the form of a brutal war of aggression. While Ukraine and its incredibly courageous people are the direct victims of the, Rus of the Russian assault, the latter also challenges the international legal order at its core. In international legal terms, Russia's war of aggression and the atrocities this war involves do not only violate the rights of Ukraine they concern the international community as a whole. This means that international accountability efforts must aim at both, providing justice for Ukraine and its people, 
and contributing to the resilience of the international legal order. The most important obstacle to comprehensive and effective international accountability efforts is the paralysis of the UN Security Council that was mentioned already. Yet, as serious and painful as the Russian blockade of the Security Council is, the UN General Assembly has risen to the challenge. This year, it has activated its well-established Uniting for Peace mechanism. On 1st March this year, the General Assembly deplored, I quote, in the strongest terms, Russia's aggression against Ukraine. And most recently, on 12th October, the Assembly has condemned Russia's latest attempts to illegally annex certain parts of Ukrainian territory. In doing so with clear-cut two-thirds majorities, the General Assembly has sent out very significant messages on behalf of the international community. Such messages should be seen as important symbolic contributions to ensure Russia's accountability for its lawless course of action. The United Nations Human Rights Council has followed up soon upon the General Assembly's lead. In March this year, it established an independent international commission of inquiry. This commission is called upon, I quote, to investigate all alleged violations and abuses of human rights and violations of international humanitarian law and related crimes in the context of the Russian Federation's aggression against Ukraine, end of quote. On Tuesday this week, the Commission submitted a report covering events as from the end of February until the end of March 2022 in four regions of Ukraine. On the basis of a reasonable grounds to conclude standard, the Commission has found that the Russian armed forces are responsible for the vast majority of the identified violations, many of which amount to war crimes. These violations include patterns of indiscriminate attacks, summary executions, unlawful confinement, ill treatment, torture, as well as rape and sexual violence. The report is explicit with respect to the suffering inflicted upon children in Ukraine. While international commissions of inquiry do not reach judicial determinations, international and national courts usually take the findings made by such commissions into account. This is so in particular with respect to ascertaining the broader context of a given conflict. This brings me to the important role that international courts have begun to play to ensure Russia's accountability. Let me begin with the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, the main judicial organ of the United Nations. There are currently two proceedings before this court. The first was instituted by Ukraine against Russia long before 24 February this year. In these first proceedings, Ukraine alleges Russian ill treatment of parts of the population in Crimea subsequent to Russia's unlawful military occupation of this part of Ukrainian territory. In the meantime, the ICJ has affirmed its jurisdiction. This means that this case has reached the merits stage. We may expect a judgment by the court by 2024. 
the second proceedings were the ones mentioned by the minister just a minute ago, instituted by Ukraine soon after 24 February this year. As is well known, President Putin, in order to help justify Russia's war of aggression, alleged that a Ukrainian genocidal campaign was underway in the eastern parts of the territory of Ukraine. The Russian president did so without having any factual basis and contrary to all relevant findings of international observers. In a skillful legal move, Ukraine has invoked the Genocide Convention in order to request the ICJ to find that Russia's allegations are ill-founded. The ICJ, as the minister mentioned, soon responded with an order for provisional measures in which it directed Russia to suspend the entire military operation it had started on February 24. This means that by continuing its war of aggression against Ukraine, Russia has been continuously violating not only the prohibition of the use of force as enshrined in the UN Charter, but also a binding order of the International Court of Justice. In the meantime, Russia has decided to participate in these second proceedings as well. As of yet, the time frame for those important proceedings remains unsettled. Remarkably, a significant number of states, Germany including, the minister just mentioned it, have expressed their intention to intervene in these proceedings in order to support Ukraine's cause. This is to confirm that the significance of the legal issue transcends the bilateral relationship between Ukraine and Russia. Let me, however, be clear as to an important limitation of the ICJ's jurisdiction. The court has no jurisdiction as regards the prohibition of the use of force. The court will therefore not be in a position to find that Russia has violated this international legal obligation. The court will therefore also not be in a position to determine that Russia is under an international legal duty to provide Ukraine with compensation for the damages they, that have resulted from Russia's war of aggression. What I have just said, regrettably, holds true beyond the ICJ. It would not appear that there is currently any international court with jurisdiction to comprehensively adjudicate on Russia's duty of compensation for its war of aggression. Yet, there can be no doubt that Ukraine is indeed entitled under international law to receive compensation for all its losses. And ensuring that such compensation actually happens must form part of the international accountability efforts. For the time being, the Russian veto will preclude the Security Council from establishing an international claims commission, such as that established after Saddam Hussein's aggression against Kuwait in 1990. As long as President Putin is in power, Russia will also not become party to an international treaty for the settlement of claims. Hence, alternative avenues must be explored, which is no easy matter. One may wonder whether the UN General Assembly may here as well play a role. Perhaps it could, as an initial step, help establish an international register to record the relevant claims. On the regional level, the European Court of Human Rights may usefully contribute to the ongoing accountability efforts 
despite Russia's expulsion from the Council of Europe. As from 16 September this year, the Russian Federation has ceased to be bound by the European Convention of Human Rights. The European Court of Human Rights has, however, correctly found that it retains jurisdiction to deal with Russian conduct prior to 16 September. Currently, there are three important so-called interstate applications introduced by Ukraine against Russia before the court. The last of those three applications concerns alleged mass and gross human rights violations by Russia committed since February this year. Here again, many third states have declared their intention to intervene in those proceedings in support of Ukraine's cause. It will be interesting to see how the European court will define its jurisdiction in these proceedings. In the past, the court has denied its jurisdiction as far as the actual conduct of hostilities is concerned. The court is now provided with a crucial opportunity to reconsider the matter. Importantly, however, the court's jurisdiction does not extend to the prohibition of the use of force, but will remain confined to those human rights as enshrined in the convention. Let me now turn to the International Criminal Court, the ICC. The manner by which this court contributes to the international accountability efforts is quite distinct. For the ICC's mandate is not to establish state responsibility, but to punish individuals for the commission of genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and or the crime of aggression. Although neither Russia nor Ukraine are state parties to the ICC statute, the ICC is currently exercising its jurisdiction over war crimes, crimes against humanity, and also genocide in the situation of Ukraine. This is so because Ukraine has accepted the court's jurisdiction with respect to this situation by way of a special declaration to that effect. Importantly, the ICC's temporal jurisdiction goes back to the year 2014, the year of Russia's first aggression against Ukraine. And it bears noting that already the predecessor of the present prosecutor of the ICC had reached the conclusion that there is a reasonable basis to believe that Russian conduct in Ukraine before 24 February 2022 may amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity. In the meantime, the current prosecutor of the ICC has formally opened an investigation into the situation of Ukraine. Those investigations extend to Russian conduct since 24 February this year. For the time being, it remains unclear at what point in the future the prosecutor might open a case against an individual suspect by seeking an international arrest warrant. With respect to the ICC's work, three things are noteworthy. First, more than 40 states parties have formally requested the ICC to conduct an investigation into the situation of Ukraine. This number is unprecedented. But may I echo Judge Goldstone, it would be very desirable to have a comparable measure of support in other situations, including African, South American, and Asian ones. Second, the United States has welcomed the court's investigation. This may suggest that the United States is prepared to reconsider its previous rejection of the court's jurisdiction over nationals of non 
state parties. Third, the prosecutor is not the only one conducting criminal investigations. Ukraine, as well as a number of other states, including Germany, are conducting investigations at the relevant national level. This unprecedented concurrence of investigations at different levels essentially constitutes a welcome development. It demonstrates that there is now a global system of international criminal justice in place in which a multitude of actors contribute their respective share to the international community goal to reduce impunity for international crimes, to hereby strengthen the international legal order. At the same time, a concurrence of criminal investigations presents a new and acute challenge of coordination. And I suspect we will hear more about it later today. This is so in the interest of the efficiency of the relevant accountability efforts and in view of the needs of the victims, for example, not to be re-traumatized through multiple testimonies of their suffering. This Tuesday's report by the Independent UN Commission of Inquiry may be read to suggest that as of now, there is room for improvement with respect to the state of coordination between the different actors. I now wish to specifically turn our attention to the crime of aggression. That is the crime to wage a war of aggression. How to deal with this crime constitutes the most important challenge in providing international criminal justice in the situation of Ukraine. There can be no doubt, President Putin and those other Russian leaders in a position to effectively exercise control over and to direct politically or military Russia's war of aggression are under suspicion to have committed a crime of aggression. Yet, the hands of the prosecutor of the ICC are currently tied. We have heard this. Due to limitations contained in the ICC statute that specifically apply to the crime of aggression, the court cannot at present exercise its jurisdiction over this crime in the situation of Ukraine. It is painful to acknowledge this glaring jurisdictional gap in the international legal architecture. Painful for at least three reasons. First, the situation of Ukraine, in the situation of Ukraine, the war of aggression constitutes, so to speak, the original sin, which has opened the floodgates to all the other atrocities. Second, the killing of Ukrainian soldiers in the course of the hostilities during Russia's war of aggression is lawful under the international law of armed conflict. Such killings can therefore not be punished as war crimes, also not as crimes against humanity or genocide. Hence, the crime of aggression is the only crime under international law which covers the responsibility of the leadership of the aggressor state for the senseless losses of human life among soldiers, especially among those of the victim state. Third, as a result of Russia's war of aggression, the prohibition of the use of force, which in the words of the International Court of Justice constitutes a cornerstone of the UN Charter, is at risk of erosion. The waging of a war of aggression was made a crime under international law precisely for the purpose of providing this cornerstone of the international legal order with resilience against the risk of erosion. It is this very context in which, and please recall it with me, that Robert Jackson, 
the chief prosecutor of the United States at the time addressed the judges of the Nuremberg Military Tribunal in his opening statement. And I will read out to you his words. I quote, the ultimate step in avoiding periodic wars, which are inevitable in a system of international lawlessness, is to make statesmen responsible to law. And let me make clear that while this is first applied against the German aggressors, the law includes, and it must, if it is to serve a useful purpose, condemn aggression by other nations, including those which sit here now in judgment. Today, Jackson's Nuremberg promise resonates more acutely than ever since the entry of the United Nations Charter. It provides the background for what you have just heard from the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine and from Judge Goldstone. I concur with the Minister and Judge Goldstone's conviction that the international community must make every attempt to avoid setting a negative precedent concerning the crime of aggression in the face of Russia's war of aggression. Two appeals to international decision makers follow from this conviction. First, States parties to the ICC statute should now begin working toward changing the statute in order to overcome the constraints that currently tie the hands of the prosecutor of the ICC. Those constraints have been imposed on the ICC for no good reasons. They are unprincipled and adversely affect the legitimacy of the international criminal justice system. Second, states should consider favorably closing the existing jurisdictional gap regarding the crime of aggression through the establishment of a special international criminal tribunal for the crime of aggression in the situation of Ukraine. It would be wrong to see such a tribunal as a competitor to the ICC. Quite to the contrary, such a tribunal should be seen as a functional extension of the ICC, serving the global international criminal justice system in a manner complementary to the ICC's work. Quite similar to the international criminal tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, such a special tribunal would help prepare the ground for moving international criminal justice forward. In, in this case, in the, in the direction of enabling the ICC to assume its proper role in adjudicating, but preferably in preventing the crime of aggression in the future. The special tribunal in question should be based on a treaty between Ukraine and the United Nations. The treaty should be concluded upon the recommendation of the UN General Assembly. This would provide the tribunal with a robust universal instead of only regional legitimacy. If the need is desperately felt to keep the budgetary implications to a minimum, one could begin the process by establishing an interim mechanism for conducting the relevant investigations. Such an interim mechanism would bear a certain resemblance to the United Nations War Crimes Commission during World War II. And its establishment would by itself convey a most welcome message in the right direction. This concludes my brief account on the state of international accountability efforts. Please allow me to conclude with an appeal to the German government, not as a scholar of international law, but as a German citizen. Germany has not only taken a very active part in the establishment of the ICC in general, in view of its own aggressive past, which gave rise to the Nuremberg precedent, Germany has also been working consistently since about 1997 to make its contribution specifically to the fulfillment of Jackson's Nuremberg premise, promise, excuse me, on the crime of aggression. This was so 
at the Rome conference in 1998, when the crime of aggression entered into the ICC's jurisdiction, albeit only in embryonic fashion. This was so at the Kampala conference in 2010, when the crime of aggression was defined for the first time in legal history. And this was so in 2017, in the midst of another dramatic night of negotiations in New York, when the ICC's jurisdiction over the crime of aggression was eventually activated. Since then, the German government has, however, fallen silent concerning the crime of aggression, as if enough had been done on the subject. But more work is required as a matter of urgency. This is not only because of Ukraine's legitimate demands, it is so also because providing the existing rules-based international legal order with resilience at its core so requires. I appeal to Germany's government to assume its responsibility and to contribute its chair. It would not require to change direction. It would mean no more than to stay loyal to its policy of the past 25 years or so in the service of the global international criminal justice system. Thank you very much.